1 Kings chapter 18. We're continuing our series, Elijah, Prophet of Fire and Faith. Thank you for those joining us here today and those joining us online. The title of today's message is, I've Seen Fire and I've Seen Rain. (laughs) And we'll see both of those in this passage. Over the last month, I have been on a diet uh, because of December was not a good month for me. And, uh, and so my wife has put me on a, a diet, and for the most part, I've done pretty well. I've, uh, once you kind of step away from sugar, which is my, my, my greatest problem, I, I, I think, you know what, I, I kind of got this thing licked. And the truth of the matter is, is, is maybe I'll never have sugar again. That's kind of what I think sometimes. But I have this daughter, and, 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 and I really do care for her most of the time. And, uh, but she's decided during this time of dieting and refraining from uh, excess, uh, she decided that it would be a great idea to bake cookies every other day. And so, uh, and so I'm doing uh, okay at first. I'm feeling pretty strong. I'm feeling pretty uh, resolute. A- a- and then I start smelling those cookies uh, wafting in the house. And I'm telling you, you can't outrun cookie smell. You can't go to your bedroom. You can't lock the door. It's going to seep into every pore in the house. And then I find that my, uh, my resolute nature is beginning to waver. I start thinking I'm pretty strong. I've made my choice. I'm pretty committed. And then those uh, wonderful uh, pastries or, or, or baked goods or whatever you call them end up placing themselves uh, right where I have to walk by all the time. And my resolve begins to weaken. Uh, Israel was struggling with resolve. Israel was struggling struggling with doing right. Uh, they would have times, they'd have moments of doing a great job of, of serving the Lord. And they would have times of revival and say, God, I'm never going to go and follow after that false God again. But then they'd begin to waver their commitment their choice of God began to weaken over time and we know after looking at first kings the last couple of weeks at the time of Israel uh, their uh, uh, resolute uh, following after the Lord has uh, has really wavered uh, considerably uh, for really hundreds of years uh, at this point um, so to get a little bit of review, if you haven't been here the last couple of uh, weeks, looking at the life of Elijah and how God has, has used him and God has uh, used Elijah to bring a drought upon the nation of Israel, not because God's cruel, not because he's mean, but he's saying, God, he's saying, Israel, I want your attention. I need you to pay attention. You are not following after me. Uh, your heart is far from me. And so I, I have allowed this drought to come uh, at the hands of Elijah. But they see that God had used Elijah to uh, help uh, miraculously provide for a widow. And we saw the power of resurrection uh, of this widow's son. And we saw uh, the the great faith of uh, uh, Elijah. But we'll see in this passage this morning, Elijah's incredible call for Israel to choose to do right. One of the largest segments in our, our one of the fastest growing uh, parts of our, our culture, if you want to call it a religious part, or, or uh, facets of our religious community in the United States, is the growth of the nuns, not the Catholic people with little uh, little head things. I'm talking about the growth of the nuns, the people with uh, zero religious affiliation. Uh, matter of fact, the number is up to 20% of Americans say that they have no particular religious affiliation at all. And it is one of the, the highest uh, growing groups in our country. Now, it's a, there's a lot of interesting dynamics. These are people that are not claiming to be atheists or agnostics uh, per se. Matter of fact, many of them would say that they are spiritual, uh, but they are not uh, religious. And, and so this is a, 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 a huge growing uh, population in our culture. 
there is a large group of our, particularly young people, have said, I, I, I refuse to choose. I, I'm not going to uh, align myself with anything. And just like the people of Israel and just my own heart, as we are prone to wonder, uh, God says, follow my ways, do right, but our hearts are prone to wonder. We must choose. It's an act of the will, as we'll see in this passage this morning. So the main idea for this morning is for us to choose to passionately follow God. That we are to choose to passionately follow God. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this morning. Boy, thank you for your word. And I thank you for the truth that is in it. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen, that you would awaken our hearts to the reality of who you are. God, help us to understand that we cannot wonder, we cannot uh, vacillate, Lord, that we must choose to follow you or to stand away from you. There is no in-between. So God, help us with passionate hearts to follow after you. And Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. So we're looking at the, the entirety of chapter 18, and so uh, I'm only going to be able to read a, a couple verses here and there, uh, otherwise we'd run out of time pretty quickly. Uh, but look at verses uh, 1 and 2 of chapter 18. So after many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. And now the famine was severe in Samaria. So God told Elijah to go and confront Ahab. He said, this is going to be the end of the drought. That uh, I've, 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 I've done this drought to wake up Israel to, uh, to get their attention. And I've got one more thing that's going to happen, uh, uh, Elijah. Uh, but, the, but the time of the drought is over. There is a severe famine in the land. And if you've watched any kind of modern-day documentaries, uh, which we still have uh, famines now in modern-day history, if you can uh, believe Believe that and, and how brutal and how difficult that is uh, for people uh, to live through. Uh, during this time, we, we learned that Jezebel, uh, Ahab the king, his uh, wicked wife, has been killing uh, the prophets of God, and she's been looking for Elijah. And this is playing out like an old west show. I mean, I, I could just picture uh, uh, on all the buildings, uh, wanted dead or alive. I want Elijah dead. You can hear Bon Jovi playing in the background, right? A little dead or alive. Okay, that's good. And, uh, and so and she, she wants him dead. She's killing any prophet that she can get her hands on, and she wants Elijah dead most of all. But look at verses 17 through 19 with me. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have and your father's house because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now therefore send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Car at Carmel and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who was kind of like Baal's girlfriend, uh, who eat at Jezebel's table. So Elijah confronts Ahab. If you can uh, imagine this, that uh, this, there's uh, Ahab and, and it's just stewing. He's been told that they're going to meet together at this spot, and he's been just cursing the name and thinking about this guy, Elijah, for three years when he just sauntered into his uh, courtroom and said there was going to be no rain. And so he's coming there again, and, uh, and he is not happy with Elijah, and he says uh, uh, that you are the troubler of Israel. Now, if you really actually follow that root word that's uh, where you can get to, in the original language here snake he said Elijah you're a snake in the grass and what does Elijah do he starts his knees start shaking and he says oh maybe we can come up with a, a compromise I'm sorry now that's not what you see in this passage he says I'm not the troubler of Israel Ahab you're the troubler you're the one that's brought this 
on Israel. You and your father's house. It takes courage to do what he's done. Elijah defends the character of God. He says they follow the Baals, plural, because uh, there were sort of uh, local uh, understandings uh, of this uh, of this uh, this this God of uh, of Baal, and so they had uh, different sort of versions of him uh, from town to town. But Elijah is saying the root problem here, Ahab, is spiritual. It's not physical. He said, yeah, we don't have any rain, but there's a reason we don't have rain. And the reason it is because the God that you have forsaken. The problem is not primarily physical here. It's that it is spiritual. And many of the problems that we face, I'm not saying all the problems that we face, many of the problems that we face have their root in a spiritual problem. And until we are willing to face whatever the root of that spiritual problem is, we're not able to fix the fruit of whatever that problem is. That's what's happening in Elijah and Ahab's case. And so then Elijah, a prophet, not a king, commands the king what he should do. He commands Ahab to bring the prophets of Baal and Asherah to Mount uh, Carmel uh, for, sh- for a showdown. And he says, I want all of Israel there. I want all, I-, I want people to witness this. I don't want this to happen between you and I. And then you lie about it because you're the real troubler of Israel. He says, I want all of Israel to see who the one real God is. And just like an old west showdown, we are called to the, uh, to the, mount, to mount, the mountain of Carmel. Uh, as you may or may not know from uh, Scripture, that Mark, Mount Carmel is uh, a really, it's a really a beautiful location. It is uh, really close uh, to the Mediterranean. And so, uh, so uh, when he talks about water later on in this passage, that's very possible in this drought that they're getting water from the Mediterranean. And, and so this is a, a beautiful uh, place in Israel. Now, Keep this in mind, it's also sort of considered a sacred dwelling uh, for Baal, just like uh, if you've heard about the, the uh, Zeus and, uh, and Mount Olympus, they sort of believe the gods lived up there. This was supposed to be a sacred dwelling place. Uh, so I, I bet Ahab, he's like, oh yeah, that sounds like a real good place. Uh, if, 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 Ahab, if, uh, if, if Baal's got a shot, it's going to be because uh, we've our, our, got our home court uh, advantage here. And skip down with me to, uh, to verse 20. We'll look at verse 20 and 21. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. They didn't say anything because they've been riding the fence for so long. They had spaghetti backbones. They were people without conviction. Elijah says, stop limping. The real idea here is stop wavering in between. It's not going to do you any good. I remember one time when I was a child, I overestimated my uh, running ability and uh, there was a car coming in my cul-de-sac I thought I'm going to I'm going to get across the street uh, before this car can, can get there and this is not a good plan and, uh, and so uh, I, I take off running and, and I can tell about halfway between the other side of the road that I'm going to lose this battle and that I'm not half as quick as I thought I was and I end up just kind of freezing Uh, because I realized this is going to hurt really bad. Now, fortunately, this was one of our neighbors and has been watching this this dumb kid standing on the side of the road just waiting to see if he can beat me across the road. And so they stopped and... And, uh, and I did not end up getting squished in the process. Uh, but it is a dangerous game to vacillate. It's a dangerous game to be stuck in the middle of the road. And this is exactly where Israel was at. So I, 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 maybe a little God sounds good, a little Yahweh sounds good, a little Baal sounds good, whatever serves us. And Elijah said, you need to choose who you're going to serve. So then he sets the rules in verse 22 and 24 for the showdown. 
So then Elijah said to the people, I, even I, only am the prophet of the Lord. Now, Elijah knew that there was other prophets because we had seen him have a, a, a previous conversation uh, with uh, another uh, guy uh, in, in earlier part of chapter 18. But he's the only one who's showing up to this showdown. He said, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us and let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. And you call upon the name of your God and I will call upon the name of, name of the Lord and the, and the God who answers by fire. He is God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken, amen. And remember, so Baal, he's supposed to be sort of the God of thunder. He's going to have akin to Thor. That's one of his uh, abilities. If, if, if anything, Baal could, should be able to do this. He's not the God of, of snow cones and blizzards. Uh, he should be able to cast down fire if he was a, a real God. So he sets the rules. One versus 850 prophets. Two bulls would be cut up. Uh, no fire. You call on your God, and I'll call on my God. And whoever's God answers, that's the real God. And there's, this is, the, the way Scripture plays, that's sort of a, a comical scene here. Uh, it, the prophets of Baal uh, began crying out for hours and hours, and, 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 and nothing's happening. Uh, they begin um, uh, cutting themselves and ranting and raving, and they keep trying to, to work themselves in a frenzy, and maybe trying to work the people in the uh, in, in a frenzy, but uh, they but nothing's happening. And so, just picture this scene. This is, so uh, Elijah maybe is just sitting, uh, maybe he's sitting by a, a, a tree, and maybe he's got a I don't know a piece of grass in his mouth, and he's just watching this. And then he begins to mock these prophets, and he says, ah, maybe, uh, maybe Baal's uh, sleeping. Uh, maybe he's on vacation, and they're just ranting and raving, and they're doing whatever they get. And he says, uh, maybe your God's in the, the bathroom, guys. Uh, maybe he'll get around to it when he gets a chance. And so, uh, so Elijah begins uh, mocking this prophet, and uh, these guys are, are worked into a frenzy, and Elijah, cool and collected, not worried about it at all. So Elijah calls the people together. He begins to rebuild the altar. He puts 12 stones together to symbolize the 12 tribes of Israel. Even though they were divided at this time, God still saw them as one people. And then he has trenches dug, and he fills them with water, and then he pours bulls, uh, pulls water on the bulls uh, three times. This is not how you do a fire. This is the opposite of how you light a good fire. But he said, I, I want to show that there's nothing impossible for our great God. Read along with me in verses 36 through 40. We'll be done looking at this part. And at that time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord God of Abraham and Isaac and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me that, these, that, these, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stone and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, uh, the Lord he is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and slaughtered them there. So Elijah prays a simple prayer. He doesn't dance around. He doesn't cut himself. He doesn't scream and dance. He simply prays, God, the one true God, show yourself. And that's exactly what God does. And they commanded, and then he commanded them to seize the prophets, which is uh, the, the wicked prophets. This was in accordance with the Mosaic law. He wasn't just angry. Uh, this was what God had commanded people to do uh, to false prophets in Israel. 
And we know in the next section that we won't be able to get to today, uh, the latter part in verses 41 through 46, we see God sends the rain. God does exactly what he said he would do. So there's a couple of principles, there's a couple of applications that we can look at this morning. Are you guys with me? This is a, this is a great passage. This is an exciting passage. So I hope uh, everybody's listening. Point number one says that we need to commit to do right as believers. You need to commit to doing right. You see, commitment presupposes purpose and understanding. Brothers and sisters, it's not going to happen on accident. Olympic athletes don't accidentally turn into world-class Olympians. You don't accidentally lose weight, and you don't accidentally grow closer to the Lord. It is a commitment. It is choice. It is a matter of the will. And saying, God, I commit my ways to you. There are many uncommitted Christians in this world. Uh, Many of them are probably the ones filling out on those polls uh, saying that they are part of the nuns. But God says this should not be so. Uh, In football, you have an area called the neutral zone. Uh, that's when you have, you have the offense and you have the defense, and they are facing off against one another, right? And before the ball is snapped, before the play begins, there's an area called the neutral zone in between the two teams. And neither one of the teams are allowed to break that area. And if they do break that area, uh, you, then you, they get penalized. And so if you are on offense and you break that area, uh, then you are going to have to move your team backwards because you're not allowed to stay in the neutral zone and in a much more a real way God says I don't want you to stay in the neutral zone I don't want you to be lukewarm you have to choose either follow me or don't follow me you cannot stay in the in-between zone because what you'll do you'll end up bringing yourself backward you'll end up bringing your team backward and so you need to pick who you want to serve Understand, committing to do right is a commitment to choose to stand against the majority. Jesus said it, broad is the way to death and destruction, but you must follow the narrow road. Friends, it has always been this way. It's not just this way because of the rise of the nun or we're in a a post-Christian culture. It has always been this way. To be part of God's people means to be in the minority with other people. If you want to do right, you have to choose many times to walk alone. But sometimes walking alone can be scary. There's been a lot of uh, hiking trails I've done with other people, and I hadn't thought twice about it. But uh, when I started hiking it by myself, I started thinking, boy, that bush kind of looks a lot more like a a bear than I remember it looking like, right? And you start getting a little worried. It's easier to be uh, afraid when you are alone. Luke chapter 14, 28 through 30 says this. Jesus said this. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish it, all will see it and begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Jesus is telling us to count the cost. That's in the context of discipleship. He says, if you want to follow me, brothers and sisters, you're going to have to count the the cost and many times to follow the Lord there is a cost sometimes it's a cost in friendship sometimes it could be your job sometimes it is your family and in other parts of the world and dangerous parts of the world it can even cost your life to choose to follow after the Lord but God says it is worth it but you've got to count the cost got to make your choice. You cannot stand in the neutral zone. To choose to stand against the majority, to come in to do right, is to pre-decide. I heard a, a pastor describe this the other day, and, and I like that, the way he described it. It is to pre-decide. 
before facing a decision, before facing a situation, pre-decide to do right. So I'm not going to wait till I'm faced with this temptation, I'm faced with this problem, and then I'm going to sort of mull it over for a little bit. No, what you can do now is pre-decide to do right. Say, God, no matter what comes, no matter what the situation is, I'm going to follow your ways. I'm going to do right. I decide that right now. Now, some situations are going to become avoidable under those circumstances. If you're a person who struggles with alcoholism and, and substance abuse, then you can choose right now to not go to the bar tonight or this uh, coming weekend because you know that you're going to be too weak for that. Pre-decide. Don't circle the bar a couple times and try to make that decision. Now, you can make that decision now. But we know after living in this world for any period of time that there are some things that are unavoidable, right? We can't avoid all temptations. We can't avoid all problems. Maybe you said, I, I do not want to be a, a malicious gossip. I've been that before, and I don't want to do it again. It's sinful, and it's wrong, but you know that everybody in your work is a malicious gossip. And, and so, but that's unavoidable. So you're going to have to say, God, help me to, to pre-decide when I know that situation comes that I'm going to do right. I'm not going to put people down. I'm going to do right. Brothers and sisters, you must commit to do right. Commit to do right. I know that's simple. I know that's, 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 uh, that's not terribly profound, but this is what God's word says, that there is right and there is wrong, and we must choose to do the right. So commit to do right. Look at point number two with me, finally. The Bible says that we cannot serve two masters because we will hate the one and we will love the other. Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters. You will hate one, and you will love one. That's how it works. I, I've, got, I've got a small little garage in my house, so I'm very careful uh, about what I agree to, to people uh, to give me sometimes. And because I know uh, many times if I'm going to take something, it means I'm going to have to get rid of something else. I just don't have enough space in there. And Jesus, knowing the, knowing the heart of man, says, he said, you only got space for one master. And, 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 and you, can't, you can't vacillate uh, between the two. And it's either going to be the Lord or it's going to be somebody or something else. And, and he will not share room with anybody else you only got space for the one Israel was struggling with idolatry but you know what in the 21st century brothers and sisters we struggle with idolatry too uh, maybe we don't necessarily uh, worship trees and, and and the elements and the sun and moon and all that kind of stuff but idolatry is just as true and just as palpable and real in our culture today and many times in our own heart. Let me give you this definition of an, an idol. It is anything that you look to or you long for in God's place. An idol is anything that you look to or you long for in God's place. In other words, an idol is a rival for your heart. And anything can be put in that category. A, a, a spouse can be a good thing. A job can be a good thing. But there are many people that will find their security not in the Lord their God, but they'll look in their strength of their health. They'll look in their relationship. They'll look at how many uh, zeros they have in their bank account. And they'll say, that's what gives me security. Then, friends, that is an idol in your heart because you have replaced God with whatever else it is. And our culture worships all sort of idols. They worship the God of materialism, the God of athletics, the God of reputation, accomplishment, and respect. And we say, God, I know I'm supposed to find my value in you and what you say I am, but I find value because of what I've done and what I can do. That's an idol. And God says we cannot have idols in our lives. Now we are to identify these idols. So if we want to confront idols, this is how we're going to do it. First, we've got to identify these idols. We do this by examining our heart, 
and examining our history. Are you listening with me, church? How do I know if I've got idols in my life? Well, I'm not worshiping stumps anywhere, uh, so, but I gotta go look into my, my heart. I gotta look at my heart, and then I gotta look at my history. God, is there anything in my life? Search me and know my heart in times of prayer, in times of reflection with the Lord. God, is it true? What do I find my satisfaction in? What am I striving for? What do I find my security in? And you look to these truths, and you say, God, if there's anything other than than you is an idol, and please expunge it, remove it from my heart. But don't just look to your heart, look to your history, because the heart can be deceitful. And so you can always believe what your own heart and what your mind says. So then you better look at your history and say, when the chips were down, God, what did I do? Look at my history. Did I, did I actually do? Did I actually rely on you? This past year, this past month, this past week, does my life reflect a life? that trust you or do I look to other things that's how you can tell if you have idols in your life so that's how, how you can examine it. look at your heart look at your history and the Bible says when you have idols in your life you need to cast them out we don't coddle them we don't keep them we cast them out the Bible says that you have to root them out and you have to replace them when you find these idols in your heart you don't keep them there you have to dig them out you got to root them out and friends if they've been embedded in your heart for a long time it's gonna be hard to get those out of your life but you're gonna have to root them out but here's the important part and a lot of people forget this next step then you got to replace it you can't, if, if you root out an idol in your life, well, so, well, it was this person, and now that person's out of my life, and uh, you have a vacuum in your heart. You know what? Your, your heart is an idol factory. And before you know it, you'll put another idol in there. And Jesus said, don't, don't, don't just replace it with an idol. Root it out and replace it with the love and the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. And so I won't have any other affections for anything uh, besides, first and foremost, Christ Jesus. He's where I find my identity. He's where I find my security. I'm going to root it out and I'm going to replace it with the confidence and the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ in my life. Brothers and sisters, we must face these usurpers in our hearts. We must face these rivals in our lives. We cannot keep these in our heart if we want to choose the one true God. Now, when somebody uh, goes away for a, a, a period of, of time, every once in a while, you've heard news stories about this, a squatter will come and live in somebody's house. And a squatter, by definition, is a person who lives in somebody's dwelling, but they have no legal right to be there. But it's not always easy to get a squatter out of someone's life. And the truth of the matter is, as many of us have squatters of idols in our hearts and in our lives, and, 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 and they have no legal right to be there. God says that you are a blood-bought child of God, that you are an heir to the king himself, that you are as holy in the eyes of God because of Christ Jesus, as Christ Jesus is himself. It has no legal right, and you cast out that rival. And you say, God, I want Jesus Christ to be enthroned in my heart. Your heart is the throne room for Christ and no other. That's what it means to cast out idols. Brothers and sisters, we are all prone to waver and we are all prone to wonder. But you must choose an act of the will you don't stumble in to following faithfully after the Lord you must choose I encourage you brothers and sisters choose to passionately follow after Christ